an often quote, an often quoted statement by Martin Luther concerning the epistle of James tended to discourage early Bible students from studying it. In his introductory, uh, uh, his introduction of the German uh, New Testament, he made a, a comparison of the epistle of James to the writings of uh, Peter, Paul, and John, claiming that these writers give all that a Christian needs to know about Christ and salvation that's found in him. He said that in regards to Peter, John, and Paul. But of James, he wrote, Therefore is St. James' epistle a right strawy epistle in comparison with them? For it has no gospel character to it. Now, Luther, of course, struggled with the concept of faith and works in James chapter 2 and believed that it uh, opposed and contradicted what Paul wrote in the book of Romans, as well as the priest's own theology about salvation by faith alone. Others have indicated, it's been passed down orally speaking, that Luther himself tore out the book of James from his Bible. Well, again, that is oral tradition. There is no historical evidence of Luther doing such a thing. And so if there is no evidence, historically speaking, of him doing that, then I would suggest that uh, most likely, no, he didn't actually do it. But he did make this statement here in the introduction of his German New Testament translation of the Bible. Now, although James is not profoundly doctrinal in content, as one might find among the writings of Paul, uh, Peter, and, um, and John, uh, but although James does not present the gospel message, message of salvation in the same manner as the other writers, he certainly reflects the teachings of Jesus, especially in the Sermon on the Mount. Some have referred James's letter as a practical commentary of the Sermon on the Mount from Jesus, who is the wisdom from above. Though James does not quote Jesus verbatim, there is still a relationship between the two. Notice this. Matthew chapter 5, verse 3, is in direct connection to James chapter 2, verse 5. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. And did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? Matthew 4. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. James chapter 4, verse 9 and 10. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. Matthew chapter 5, verse 5, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. James chapter 1, verse 21, Receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your soul. Notice how the meek will inherit the earth. Jesus has always been talking about spiritual and eternal things. So when he says inherit the earth, when we receive the word with meekness, the implanted word which is able to save our souls, what happens? Well, when we obey the gospel, it saves our souls, and we receive an inheritance within heaven. So, the inheritance of the earth that Jesus is talking about, is he talking about this physical earth? No, because Jesus has always been talking about spiritual and eternal things. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth, being the new heavens and new earth. But that can only happen when we receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save our souls. Matthew 5, 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. James chapter 3, verse 18. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Matthew 5, 7, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. James chapter 2, verse 13, For judgment will be merciless to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs judgment. Matthew chapter 5, verse 8, 
Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. James chapter 4, verse 8. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Matthew 5, 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Again, James 3, 18. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Matthew chapter 5, verse 10 through 12. Blessed are those who are persecuted. Blessed are you when men cast insults at you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. James chapter 1, verse 12, and chapter 5, verse 10 and 11. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life. As an example, brethren, of suffering and patience, that the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we count those blessed who endured. You have heard of the endurance of Job and have seen the outcome of the Lord's dealings, that the Lord is full of compassion and is merciful. Compare also the swearing of oaths in Matthew chapter 5, verse 33 through 37 with James chapter 5, verse 12. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Matthew chapter 7, verse 11. How much more will your Father who is in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? James chapter 1, verse 5 and 17. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father. Matthew 6, 19. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. James chapter 5, verse 2 and 3. Your riches have rotted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have rusted, and their rust will be evidence against you. You have laid up treasures in the last days. Matthew 5, 22. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. James chapter 4, verse 11. Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother speaks against the law and judges the law. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. James chapter 4, verse 1 through 4. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Matthew chapter 7, verse 1 through 5. Judge not that you be not judged, for with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. James chapter 4, verse 12. There is only one lawgiver and judge. He who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your brother? See, the people that James was writing to, they were casting judgments and measuring others by their own standards and by their own laws. That is what they were exactly doing. And that's what Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 7, verse 1 through 5, tells us not to do. We should not measure and judge others by our own standards. There's only one lawgiver. So when we do judge others first, we evaluate ourselves. Make sure that we're right with God. Take that speck out of our own eyes so then we can be able to help our brothers. So we are called to judge, but not judge others by our own standards, but by the one lawgiver, God's standard. Folks, there's many many more that I could have shared with you on this PowerPoint slide and through the study, but obviously I believe that I made the point clear. James is the practical commentary of the Sermon of the Mount from Jesus, who is the wisdom from above. A little bit about the author. The first words of the letter, chapter 1, verse 1, identify its author. 
It says, James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Just the signing of his name suggests that this was a prominent figure in the early church. The name James was common in the first century, and there are several men mentioned by that name in the New Testament. So I like to look at four of those that have been mentioned in the New Testament. The Apostle James, son of Zebedee, the brother of John, Mark chapter 3, verse 17. This apostle was martyred by Herod Agrippa sometime around A.D. 44, Acts chapter 12, verse 2. That is, before this epistle was even written. So, was it the Apostle James, son of Zebedee, the brother of John? Nope, most likely not, because the letter was written a couple years after the death of James, the son of Zebedee. What about the Apostle James, son of Alphaeus, other, uh, otherwise known as James the Less, Mark chapter 15, verse 40? Well, the writer of our epistle seems to be a man of reputation and well-known, but nothing is really known about the son of Alphaeus, which probably indicates that he did not have a high profile among the churches of the first century. So, was it the Apostle James, son of Alphaeus? Most likely not. What about James, the father of Judas? Well, <laughs> we have no information about this man and cannot even confirm if he was a follower of Jesus. All we know is that he was the father of Judas. Luke chapter 6, verse 16, and Acts chapter 1, verse 13. So, most likely not. Is it James, the Lord's brother? An elder at Jerusalem? Yes. This is the correct view. Jesus had both brothers and sisters in the flesh, and James is listed first in both gospel accounts, which may indicate that he was the oldest after Jesus. Matthew chapter 13, verse 55, and Mark chapter 6, verse 3. He was a man of great influence and reputation in the church. You can look at Galatians chapter 1, verse 9. Uh, verse 19, chapter 2, verse 9 and 12, Acts chapter se uh, 12, verse 17, and Acts chapter 15, verse 13. Early on in Jesus' ministry, we do have a written account that James did not believe at first, John chapter 7, verse 5. But later on, he was a witness to the resurrection and come to believe, Acts chapter 1, verse 14, and 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 5 and 7. Now, some have thought James to be some sort of a legalist or a Judaizer because of the mention of those coming from James in Galatians chapter 2, verse 12. Judaizers were Jewish Christians who demanded uh, that Gentiles wanting to be accepted as Christians must be circumcised and keep certain elements of the law of Moses. That James did not accept the Judaistic demands, is evidenced by his role in the Jerusalem Council of Acts chapter 15 and following. Those who think James was a Judaizer would refer to the incident as well in Acts chapter 21 verse 18 through 26, where James and the elders at Jerusalem convinced Paul, actually they, uh, they, wanted, they made a decision for Paul uh, to perform a Nazarite vow along with a few other men, and to offer a burnt offering for sin at the temple. A lot of people use this as an illustration to say that James was in fact a Judaizer. But the fact of the matter is, is that just because he and the elders made a decision to have Paul to perform a Nazarite vow and to offer a burnt offering for sins at the temple does not mean that he's a Judaizer. Instead, it shows that James is a human being like you and I. It shows that James and the elders at Jerusalem at the time made a very horrible, bad, poor decision. They gave in to peer pressure. The Jews at the time were pressuring them, pressuring them, and pressuring them, and they gave in to peer pressure, hoping that this would kind of settle things down. But unfortunately, that was not the case. It was the wrong way to handle the situation among the Jewish peers. James is not a legalist 
or a Judaizer. He refers to himself as a bond servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. The expression bond servant comes from the Greek word that denotes the lowest class of slaves that have no rights, no wills, and no privileges. He is the type of slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. James gave up all rights, all his rights, in order to serve the Lord. He gave up his own self-will in order to serve the will of Jesus Christ. He no longer cares about his own privileges because the greatest privilege on earth is to serve God and the Lord Jesus Christ. James certainly associates himself with Christ and Christianity, not with Judaism. James never bothered telling the people that Jesus is his brother because James is more concerned about teaching what his brother taught. Outside of the New Testament, he is called James the Just and later nicknamed Camel Knees because he constantly prayed on his knees. We are uncertain about his death, but Josephus records that James was stoned by A.D. 62 by orders from the Sadducees of the Sanhedrin court, while another tradition says that he was thrown off the pinnacle of the temple. Now, whatever his demise may have been, what we do know for certain is that James remained faithful unto death. So who is the author? It is James, the Lord's brother, an elder at Jerusalem a bond servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, who is he writing to? Who is the audience? Well, when you continue reading verse 1, it says, To the twelve tribes in the dispersion, greetings. One immediately recognizes Jewish identity. The 12 tribes, what does it mean? Well, there's three possible meanings. Number one, it could be a reference to Jews in general. Yet the evidence within the letter, such as the mention of the elders of the church in chapter 5, verse 14, points us to an audience of Christians. So, is he writing to just Jews in general? Not likely. Is he writing to Christians in general? Could it refer to Christians in general? Well, this is very possible. It's likely, and certainly in line with the conduct of the letter. The only issue is that there is so much Jewish terminology in the book, which brings us to the third possible meaning. A reference to Jewish Christians? Most likely. Most likely, this is written to Jewish Christians. The greeting of the letter says, to the 12 tribes in dispersion, in the dispersion. The Jews were exiled twice and deported out of Palestine, AD 44. But when they came back from their deportation, they scattered abroad. You can look at Acts chapter 8, verse 1 through 4, as well as Acts chapter 11, verse 19. James is writing to Jewish Christians who were deported, later on came back, and were now scattered abroad from persecution. Also, as mentioned prior, the letter contains several Jewish expressions. James uses the Greek word for synagogue in reference to the assembly in chapter 2, verse 2. He says, For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, that word assembly in the Greek is actually the Greek word for synagogue, but he uses it in reference to the assembly of the church. Earlier in chapter 1, verse 18, he uses the Old Testament concept of first fruits. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. That is Old Testament terminology. 
James also uses Old Testament illustrations that were familiar to the Jews, such as in chapter 2, he says, Abraham, our father, verse 21, and then later on gives the illustration of Rahab, the prostitute, verse 25. He uses another Old Testament concept regarding the anointing of oil, chapter 5, verse 14. He says, Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. He also uses the Old Testament terminology regarding the Lord of Sabaoth, chapter 5, verse 4. Behold the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud and crying out against you, and the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. That word Sabaoth is an Old Testament terminology in regards to the Lord of hosts, an army, an army full of angels. He's the Lord of Sabaoth, and we'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to chapter 5. Now, one should not be dogmatic on the question of the recipients, but the evidence seems to clearly point to a Jewish Christian audience. Well, what about the date of the book? Well, with the great dispersion mentioned in chapter 1, verse 1, and the deportation that occurred around A.D. 44, as well as the Jewish Christians scattering from persecution, this would most likely date the letter of James around A.D. 45 to 48, being the earliest New Testament letter. There is no mention about the fall of Jerusalem in the letter, which had occurred in A.D. 70. If there had been a mentioning of the fall of Jerusalem in the letter, then it would have been a later dated letter, but no mentioning of it at all. There's also no mention of the Judaizer controversy that seems to have broken out around A.D. 49, bringing about the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15. Since a lot of the material in the letter has to do with Christian conduct, an early date seems more likely because the scattered Christians would need instructions on church order and Christian behavior. Some people see James as being the New Testament Proverbs, but there are threads that connect this book so strongly, so this cannot be a style of a writing style of wisdom literature. Don't get me wrong, the theme of James is about wisdom from above, but however, the writing style is not like Old Testament wisdom literature. As I already mentioned earlier, it is more in connection to Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, a practical commentary of the Sermon on the Mount. In the letter, James uses over 60 imperatives. 60 imperatives in a five-chapter book. He wants us to pay attention here. He has a very strong emphasis on Christian morality and value. Well, this helps us kind of connect the dots a little bit about trying to find the purpose and the theme of why he's writing this letter. But speaking of the purpose and the theme, what, what else we need to do is to look at the key words. The key words will help us to understand more clearly in regards to the theme and purpose of the book. Here I have a list of 15 key words. Judgment is used 20 times in the book. The word brother or brethren is used 18 times. The word do is used 17 times. The word God is used 16 times. Faith, 16 times. Work or works, 15 times. The word Lord is used 14 times. Pray, prayer, or ask is used 12 times. The word law is used 10 times. The word righteous is used 10 times. Endurance is used six times, sin is used nine times, maturity is used five times, perfect is used five times, and wisdom is used four times. Now, bear in mind that this is the number of times the word is used in the Greek, okay? 
So obviously, if you have your English translation of the Bible, and you try to find the English word on how many times it's used, it's not going to add up to this. For example, righteous, the Greek word for righteous, is also translated as justified. Justified in the book of James. The word work or works is also translated as effective in the book of James. And the list goes on. So yes, if you were to look at the English words, I mean, it won't add up with this because this is the number of times the Greek word is used. And so seeing that we have our keywords listed out for the book of James, like I did with the epistle of John, I like to use the keywords and make one sentence and allow that sentence to be the theme of the book. And here's what I have. It says, Brethren, pray for wisdom from above that your faith may cause you to examine God's perfect law and move you to do the work of the Lord by turning away from sin, building endurance, living righteously, and reaching maturity in order that you may not fall under judgment. It is imperative for the Christian to gain wisdom from above and act accordingly. Folks, that is the theme and purpose for the book of James. For Christians to gain wisdom from above and to act accordingly. Now, I don't have this listed out, but I will go ahead, at least on the PowerPoints, that is, but I will go ahead and share it with you on how wisdom from above is, in fact, the theme and purpose of James. Chapter 1, verse 2 through 12, wisdom from above sees trials as strength to grow. Chapter 1, verse 13 through 18, wisdom from above sees lust being the source of temptation. Chapter 1, verse 19 through 27, wisdom from above is a doer of the word. Chapter 2, verse 1 through 13, wisdom from above is impartial. Chapter 2, verse 14 through 26, wisdom from above has an active faith. Chapter 3, verse 1 through 12, wisdom from above controls the tongue. Chapter 3, verse 13 through 18, wisdom from above avoids worldliness. Chapter 4, verse 1 through 6, wisdom from above continues to avoid worldliness. Chapter 4, verse 7 through 17, wisdom from above submits to God's will and law. Chapter 5, verse 1 through 6, wisdom from above avoids cheating others. Chapter 5, verse 7 through 12, wisdom from above avoids self-vengeance. Chapter 5, verse 13 through 20, wisdom from above prays in every circumstance. It is imperative for the Christian to gain wisdom from above and act accordingly to it. With that in mind, the key verse for the entire book of James is chapter 1, verse 22. Prove yourselves doers of the word, and not me merely hearers only who delude themselves. Prove yourselves doers of the word, and not merely hearers only who delude themselves. Well, folks, that is the introduction to the book of James. Hopefully tonight gave you a little bit of a good insight as far as the new book that we are going to be studying for our Wednesday night class, the book of James. And again, the theme is that we must have wisdom from above and act accordingly to it. That is, in fact, the entire purpose and theme of for the book of James. I hope this introductory uh, material was helpful and beneficial for you. 
Uh, like I said, it was very helpful and beneficial for me personally because it's going to help us truly to grasp even more the understanding of the book of James. And you will definitely see what I mean when we come back next Wednesday, if the Lord wills, and continue on in the text of James, beginning chapter 1, verse 2. Thank you all so much for joining with me tonight. I'd like to go ahead and close this out in a word of prayer. I hope you are excited for this new study. I know I am. And so as I lead us in prayer, I hope each and every one of you end up having a wonderful, blessed rest of the night and a wonderful, uh, blessed rest of your week. If you will, pray with me, and then the lesson is yours. Heavenly Father, we come before you, and our earnest prayer is that we ask for wisdom from above, that we may be able to see things the way that you see it, Father, that we can have a heavenly perspective on how to act accordingly in our lives each and every day. Father, it is imperative and important that we have this wisdom from above, for the wisdom from above came down to grant us the wisdom, and it's been recorded for us and put together in the New Testament for many generations to come. That is how we have access to the wisdom from above, is through your perfect law, the law of liberty, the law of faith, the law of Christ, the New Testament law. Father, let us be very excited and very enthusiastic about this new study of the book of James, seeing that we need to have this wisdom from above, and Father, let us share with others about this wisdom from above, that they too can have it, as long as they are willing to open their hearts, to believe in your Son, to see him as their Lord, Master, Ruler of their life, and to put him on through baptism. Father, this is a wisdom that is not like any type of earthly wisdom. This is a wisdom that's from heaven. And Father, let us take it with us and let us share it with others so that we can bring more lost souls to your Son, Jesus Christ. Let us be bond servants of you. Let us cast aside our rights. Let us let go of our self-will, our selfish desires. Let us cast away our own privileges so that we can be able to seek your will, to do your will, and to serve you and others. We thank you so much for your son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life on that cross so that we can have hope of eternal life with you one day. And it's our prayer through your son's most holy and righteous name, Jesus, the Christ, the Lord, our master. Amen. Thank y'all so much for tuning in. I'm very looking forward to the book of James, and I hope you are too. Thank you all so very much. If you have any other comments, uh, questions, thoughts, concerns, or any encouragements, please feel free to post it down in the comments section below. Other than that, have a wonderful, blessed rest of the night.